a uh, fairly comprehensive uh, crash course in photography. And it's not necessarily all around uh, Neatarts Bay. It can be for photography anywhere. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get started right away. Next. So a photographer, uh, there's a couple of quotes here. Most of you have heard of Ansel Adams. You don't take a photograph, you make it, is one of his quotes. And then there's a Art Wolf, who is a Seattle photographer, whom I took a course from one time, uh, has a kind of a photographic travel log on OPB. And some of you may have seen it because they keep running it over and over and over again called Travels to the Edge. But it's kind of a fun program. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk, talk about some picture taking basics, how to control your camera. And we're going to talk about the camera first. Now, a lot of some people are only cell phone photographers. Some, of them, some people have more advanced cameras. Some of them have some really complicated cameras. But there are some commonalities in these cameras, except for the cell phone cameras, uh, where you can actually control the camera's functions to enhance your compositions. So we're going to talk about controlling camera movement, controlling focus, uh, some camera and lens mechanics, some light, something about color, about the camera frame, subjects and objects. And we're going to talk about uh, elements and principles of design. This is something, those are things you'd get in almost any art class. And hunting for, and recognizing a good photograph and a whole bunch of other things thrown in. Okay, controlling your camera. How do you hold you, your camera? Well, the best way to hold it especially if you're using what's called a single lens reflex or a digital single lens re reflex, which is called a DSLR, is put your left hand under the lens, put your right hand under the camera or around the camera where you can put press the shutter and draw your elbows in because you want to decrease any kind of vibration or movement because the, the most common... Uh, problem with bur blurry photographs is camera movement. So use your left hand to hold the lens, right hand to uh, hold the rest of the camera and press the shutter. And also keep your feet kind of apart. Now if you're holding the camera vertically like this, the easiest thing to do is uh, use your forefinger to hold the camera and your middle finger to press the shutter button, depending on your camera. And also, if you're using a little point-and-shoot camera or um, one of the newer uh, mirrorless cameras, hold it with both hands and your elbows to your side. Or you can use a tripod. tripod and certainly, if you have lenses like this, you need something to steady it. You're not going to hold it by yourself. So there's some other uh, ways of... Um, Decreasing camera movement. Some cameras or lenses have what's called image stabilization. And I'll go into that a little bit more. You can use a fast shutter speed, and we'll talk about shutter speeds. Uh, something called mirror up. If you're using a, a single lens reflex camera, there is a mirror that uh, the image is focused on, and it's uh, reflected upwards through some prisms and out your boot viewfinder. Well, in order to uh, expose the sensor in the camera, or your film, this mirror has to flop up and that can cause uh, vibration. Or you can put what can, what's called live view, which is mirrors already up. Or you can use a, sh a remote shutter release, which I do sometimes, especially when I'm on a tripod. Okay, camera movement. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about focal length here. Um, your camera has a lens, and then there's a film plane in the back. And focal length is the distance between the center of the lens, whatever the manufacturer decide, decides the center of the lens is, to where the image plane is, where it's on your sensor. 
and the focal distance is measured in, in millimeters. So you've probably heard of a, a 50 millimeter lenses or 100 millimeter lenses or 200 millimeter lenses or variable lenses like this one was, is. This goes from 70 to 200 millimeters. And there's kind of a, a rule of thumb is, is that your shutter speed should be about one over the focal length of which you're shooting. So in this case, um, if I were shooting at 100, 100 millimeters, I would set my shutter speed to a hundredth of a second. We'll go over shutter speeds a little more thoroughly. Or you use, if you have the right kind of camera, you can put your image stabilizer on, that'll help uh, uh, stabilize the camera a bit because the camera is the camera or the lens, one or the other, it depends on the manufacturer, has, has equipped little gyroscopes inside and say minor in the lenses. And it's it's best actually for slow shutter speeds and not really useful at more than an eighth, one eight hundred of a second. And in this case, uh, in this particular lens, uh, we have a couple of different modes for hand holding the camera. Uh, mode one is just for general hand holding. Mode two is if you're panning the camera, then you don't want it to um, adjust for horizontal uh, vibration, so it turns that off. And if you're using tripod, you can just turn the stabilization off. Doesn't matter whether it's on or off, really. Or sometimes you might not want to move your camera. Uh, you can get some pretty artistic effects that way. Um, there's a photographer up in Bay City named Charlie Woolbridge, and that's his, the basis for his uh, uh, photographic art is moving his camera. Controlling focus. So I got two images here. Try and figure out which one's in focus and which, one, which one's out of focus. It's not too hard. So. The left one is in focus, the right one is out of focus. And the way you can, uh, an easy way to tell on a lot of your cameras is that once you've taken the picture, you zoom in on, on that particular picture in your camera, zoom in on a portion of it and see whether it's in focus or not. If it's not in focus, try it again. So where do you focus? Well, that depends on you. <laughs> Where do you want to focus? Um, this picture of a sea anemone, there's some of the tentacles that are in focus, some of them are out of focus. I'm not sure what the photographer was doing here. It wasn't my photo, but I pulled it off the internet. So how does a lens focus? Well, light coming through a lens, all are, that light is refracted or bent and it converges in some kind of a point. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a perfect lens, so there's not really a point, it's just kind of an area. So we have an image, we have a lens, we have a focal point where all these uh, light rays are converging, and then they actually cross over so that your image on your center is upside down. If you used an old fashioned view, view camera, you'd look through the, uh, at your, um, film plate and the image would be upside down. Uh, what your cameras do today is it has software in there to turn it right side up. By the way, your cameras are computers and you need to take advantage of that, those computer capabilities, whether, from a, whether it's from a, a, a phone or a point and shoot or a really sophisticated camera. So we're going to get a little technical here, but there's a purpose in it. Um, so we have light rays coming through and converging on a ideal focal point. Well, there's no such thing as an ideal focal point. It's an area because all lenses have some kind of uh, aberrations. They're not perfect. Um, and lens manufacturers, they go to all kinds of lengths to uh, try and get these uh, light rays to focus in a single point. They use uh, 
certain types of glass. They put multiple elements, lens elements together, glue them together. They use coatings and so on, but it never really quite works. So, but there's an area called the depth of focus, which is acceptable. So anything within what's, this is called this circle of confusion because light rays are kind of confused right here. And they're also in a circle if you did a cross section of those. So it's called the permissible circle of confusion or the depth of focus, or sometimes the um, uh, depth of field is also, that's another, same, same term. So what does this mean to us? How do you adjust that? Well, you have something in camera for, called an f-stop. And in that camera, in your camera, in the lens, there's a little diaphragm. It's a leaf diaphragm, which you can open and close. So when it's open, like this one is, can you see my, you may be able to see my cursor, because I'm using it as a pointer. Um, when all these uh, little leaves are way, way open, there's a lot of light coming into your camera. So what this diaphragm does is it adjusts the light that's passing through the lens. And so these are called f-stops, they give them numbers. And each uh, number is about half the light as the previous number. So what does this do for you? A few things. For one thing, it adjusts the depth of focus. When you, uh, have a really, uh, when your diaphragm is all the way open and have a, a, a uh, small f-stop, the smaller the number, the, <laughs> the more light's coming through. It gets a little confusing. So your depth of focus is a, is a lot shorter. If you stop it down, what they call stopping it down and making it a smaller aperture, your depth of focus is a lot uh, longer. So what is it? how does that help us? Here's how. So if your f-stops are smaller, you have the larger uh, aperture, your depth of focus is larger. So if you're focusing, say, on these fuchsias, things in the background or the foreground, foreground will also be in somewhat, somewhat focused. Maybe you want that. Um, smaller apertures uh, require more light. Um, also, the larger, uh, smaller, larger apertures will um, have the background pretty much and the foreground pretty much out of focus. So this is how you can isolate your subjects uh, by turning the. Uh, background out of focus, or maybe you want it in focus. Depends on how much you want out of the picture, but this is how you control uh, lens aperture. If you have your camera at an angle, um, say you're taking a picture of this tree, you'd only get the middle of the front trunk, that middle of the uh, trunk right there in focus. Uh, a little more if you used a uh, smaller aperture. So here's an example of that. Uh, here's a railing that was uh, focused uh, front on, and here it was focused. There was the picture was taken at an angle, so the uh, edges are out of focus. But that's all right. It depends on what you want. So a lot of cameras have what is called its mode dial, and they're all different. Uh, every manufacturer has a little different. I just picked. One of the cameras that I had. This was more of a consumer camera. And so there's some basic modes. You have this little green square or a green patch that means full automatic. The camera will do everything for you. The computer is really working for you. Or you can put them on a portrait or a landscape mode or um, macro mode or for moving objects or nighttime photographs or using a flash. They have basic modes for those, or you have more control with some of these manual uh, uh, co manual controls. Uh, AV, which is called aperture value for automatic exposures, means that you set the, you set the aperture, 
set your f-stop and the camera will set the, sh set the uh, shutter speed. So your exposure is correct, but you're using, you're controlling the depth of field with your aperture. Time value or TV in case, this case, is where you set the shutter speed and the camera sets the aperture. So if you're uh, say photographing moving object, objects, you would want your shutter speed, you, you wanna control the shutter speed or you can put it all in manual and do everything. There's a couple of different focus modes. One is single focus for stationary objects or continuous focus for moving objects where uh, the camera is focusing as the object is moving, trying to stay on it. Um, and some of the more sophisticated cameras have uh, different uh, uh, focus uh, regimes, either for single focus, single point focus, or you can um, take uh, focus of various areas and so on. The camera tries to pick out what, what should be in focus. Um, so where would you use manual focus? Or you control everything. Uh, why would you want to do this? Well, well, one thing for macro photography, you're taking pictures of little tiny things and get, getting the cram camera really close up, uh, you probably want to do, uh, control it yourself. Also, if there's not enough light to autofocus the camera, the, ca the camera focuses uh, according to contrast. If, if it can see no contrast, uh, the autofocus doesn't work. So that, say if you're uh, trying to focus some, at something on something in a very dark room or at nighttime, uh, a lot of times your autofocus doesn't work. And if you're trying, trying to auto, do it, have it in autofocus, and you keep pushing your shutter, it's not, nothing's working. So you have to put it in manual. Uh, if you're, some cameras, the more sophisticated ones will have a magnification extender. Say if I have a 200 millimeter lens and I want to extend that mag magnification, I can put this little device called an extender in between the camera and the lens to say maybe turn that, uh, a 200 millimeter lens into a 400 millimeter lens, but sometimes it doesn't get enough light to autofocus. So then you'll have to use uh, manual. And when you're focusing at night, or photographing at night or photographing stars and you be manual. Now, something called hyperfocus. And uh, say if you're a, a scene like this, oops, didn't mean to do that back the little little mouse uh, wheel gets in my way sometimes uh, say if you want to get all these rocks these so hieroglyphs in focus at the same time get all the mountains in focus how do you do that well it depends on where you're setting your focus and there's kind of a, a quick and dirty method. Uh, you look at your, the closest thing you ha have in focus that you want in focus in your camera, determine how far away you are from it. Say if you're 10 feet away from it, double your distance for your focal point should be about where you're focusing is should be about 20 feet, for example. And that's a, it's a rough estimate. Or if you want, you can get an app for your phone that does everything, which I, I have on my phone. Okay, focusing on people and animals, where are you gonna focus? Well, most commonly you should focus on the eyes. When we look at a person or look at a pet, that's what we usually first go to. And also get the catch lights in the eyes little catch lights here. This is, a, this is my daughter's cat, cat uh, Kingston. Unfortunately, Kingston's no longer with, with us. He uh, met his fate with a coyote. Okay, in this case, I took a picture of a um, mariachi violinist down in Guadalajara, Mexico. And I didn't 
I wanted to focus on his hand because that's where the action was. So I had his hand in focus and the, the violin in focus and his head in the background. We're gonna go back to this picture for a few other reasons. Okay, shutter speed. So what is your shutter? Actually, it's a kind of a curtain that uh, goes over the sensor and it opens to, to uh, uh, have your sensor or film, if you're still using film, uh, exposed to light. And the shutter speed is the uh, amount of time that shutter is open, that curtain is open. And so the shutter speed is actually controlling the amount of time that your film or digital sensor is exposed to light. And it's measured in seconds or uh, hundreds or even thousands of a second. Or you can, you can actually have it uh, open for hours if you want for some cameras. Um, say if you're taking pictures of stars at night and you want to see the stars rotate in a circle, you can have it uh, open for all night. Um, by the way, if, you're shy, if you are taking uh, pictures of stars at nighttime. Some people, it's kind of a popular thing to do. If you don't want the, uh, if you want the stars to look like pinpoints, uh, don't have your shutter open for more than 30 seconds. And the reason is that the earth is rotating and as it rotates, the stars are moving a little bit. So your stars, if it's longer than 30 seconds, are gonna be kind of elongated. So adjusting the shutter speed can either stop or imply motion. And also it'll allow you to either, sh along with your aperture, shoot in either very bright or dark situations. Uh, stopping motion like this, uh, this would have fat, fast shutter speed. This, uh, you can see it, the surfer in the wave, uh, all the little drops of water around him. This is stop motion photography. Uh, this bicycle rider was uh, uh, taken with uh, by panning the camera, but with a um, very slow shutter speed. So the background was all all blur. Uh, very common is, uh, of getting kind of a sense of motion in a waterfall is to open your shutter or have the long shutter speed. Or if you want to look at a drop of water uh, as it splashes. Uh, Use a, sh a fast shutter speed. Couple of, same thing here um, for fireworks, uh, slow shutter speed. Um, same ideas here. This is a picture I took uh, of a fast running stream and the willows hanging over the stream. And I did about a half second exposure. Fortunately, the wind wasn't blowing and not blowing the willows around. So they stayed in focus. ISO settings, that's another thing to consider when you're using more advanced cameras. And what is an ISO setting? Some of you may remember uh, in the old days when we were using film, we had fast films and slow films. Um, uh, an example for a slow film was one called Plus X. And then there's a, a related film called Tri X that was a fast film. In other words, you get uh, with a fast film, you can uh, take uh, pictures in lower light. But also, you had a lot more uh, grain. There were there were coarser grains to the emulsion. Well, this, this ISO that was called a, the an ASA number. ISO, which stands for Internal, International Organization for Standardization. But anyway, what it does is it adjusts your image, your sensor's uh, sensitivity to light. So the lower the number, and there's no units on the numbers, and just the lower the number, the less sensitive your sensor is to light. And they can range from anywhere from the numbers from 50 to tens of thousands. So, but so the higher ISO settings are generally used for darker situations. You can use fast, 
faster st shutter speeds. But the downside is that uh, with high S ISOs, you get more noise. Your, your signal to noise ratios uh, kind of lousy. But there are some corrections for that. So when I'm choosing a setting, ISO setting, and I do once in a while, I, I change it. I look at, uh, is the subject well lit? Can I live with the amount of noise from that ISO? Uh, is my subject moving? That would, uh, or if I'm using a, a tripod, but very often I just put it on automatic ISO and let the camera decide what it should be. Those who are using point and shoot cameras don't have to worry too much about that. This is what I like mean about uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, Okay, here's an example. I took this picture uh, of just a calendar. I need something very simple. And so I set the ISO at 200. I probably should have set it at 50. Um, this is an example. Uh, and then I took the same thing again at 6,400. And you can see the difference in noise levels. This is called color noise here. And so you get this splotchiness. Uh, now you can correct it for that post-processing. I'm not going to talk too much about post-processing post -processing tonight. This is like uh, Photoshop and that sort of thing, uh, which I use all the time. So in something like that, you can use noise reduction and get rid of some of that blotchiness. So after all these things we've talked about, well, how do you take a photograph? All these things to think about. You got the lens focal length, the lens aperture, your depth of field, ISO settings, shutter speeds, and I haven't even talked about white balance, and I'm not going to. It's just how white are your whites in your picture. And that can be adjusted in some cameras. And then you have to look for your camera opportunities. Okay, let's talk about light and color. Light is everything. Photography literally, literally means drawing with light. It brings out shape and texture, defines the images, combines contrast and color, gives a three a little three dimensionality to a two two dimension medium. Now a lot of cameras will so your cam the amount of light coming into your camera is uh, with a correct amount of light depends on your exposure. And how do you tell when you have the right exposure? Uh, a lot of cameras will have something called a histogram. It's a graph. And this is, this bottom one is a graph of the amount of gray levels, the number of gray levels or the amount of light or luminosity coming in from pure black on the left to pure white on the right. Now there's 256 divisions. This goes from zero to 255. And then the height is just the uh, number of, say, gray levels at, in your frame, uh, in your whole frame, um, at the uh, number of whatever gray level it is, say maybe gray level 247 or something like that. Um, our grade level 96. And why are there 256? If you're wondering that, I'll answer that at the end of the session. <laughs> it's a long explanation. It depends on how a computer works. Now, you also have histograms on the three colors that we, um, we use, uh, blue, green, and red. So what does that mean to us? Okay. If you're taking a picture and you look at your histogram, and the whole, all the peaks are over on the left-hand side, that means your picture is too dark. If they're all over on the right-hand side, that means your picture is too bright. If that histogram is distributed across the whole um, array here of, of shades of gray, then your exposure is usually pretty good. So I pay attention to my histogram. 
Okay, lighting, available light. There's harsh light where you have harsh shadows. Uh, this was taken in Guadalajara, Mexico, at a government building. You have soft light. Well, here's a soft light and harsh light, harsh shadows, softer shadows. Same picture. Just taking, actually, I, I did this. I, I softened the shadows in Photoshop. I cheated. Soft light, like foggy day. That's light that's distributed. Light in the morning, the, go the golden hours, morning and evening. This is uh, the Chutes River, early in the morning and foggy morning. Um, here's a, one in Hawaii at uh, sunset. Evening, the go golden hours in the morning, golden hours in the evening. Morning, evening. Backlighting. Sometimes you like to have your subject be between your light source and your camera. I'll give you more of a silhouette picture, but you can get some pretty good effects that way. Um, these were taken on the Tillamook River. Or you can have uh, maybe the light shining through uh, autumn leaf like this, or this uh, flower called a fringe cup, which uh, I put on a light table because I wanted the light shining. Uh, I wanted the, a white background essentially. So I put it on, on a fluorescent light table, but it was backlit. So lighting silhouettes, that's uh, cause it's by backlighting. And I like silhouettes like that. Or this bird, former artificial light. So, okay, you're inside a building and that's what you have. You have artificial light that's coming through the window. Uh, this was in, this was in a, uh, Tequila, tequila distillery in Mexico, the Herradura. Um, this was in their museum part of it. Or you can uh, have isolating light where you want to isolate something like a, a spotlight on something. A flash. I use flash occasionally, actually rarely, but I, I do use it now and then. Um, this was also in that uh, distillery. That was one of their old stills in their museum part. And you'll notice if you follow this black line along the edge here, uh, sometimes you'll get a, a shadow like that with a flash. And so the best thing to do to, um, for that is put a diffuser on your flash. So it diffuses the light. This is called the, on this these pilings that were in knee tarts. This is called the fill-in flash. The light, the sunlight was in setting over here, and if I had not used the fill-in flash, all this would, the detail in this uh, pipe, these pilings were would be in darkness. So I, I used the fill, what's called the fill-in flash to fill in some light. Inappropriate lighting. Well, here's a picture that should never have been taken. <laughs> Not only lighting that's wrong, there's some other things that are wrong too. So we're going to color. Color is another dimension and we should take advantage of it. I mean, I like photographing in black and white too. I love color. And these were, I was in Guadalajara again. I was in a fabric shop and I took, I loved the way they had these fabrics displayed. And I was taking pictures of them and I got kicked out of the fa fabric shop for taking pictures. But anyway, I still got them. Obviously, color is important here. So what kind of color are there? There's, certain, several, there's different types of color. Uh, there's transmitted color. That's the kind your camera is using. That's the kind your TV uses, red, blue, green. And it's called additive because if you added them all together, you get the color white. Then there's what's called CMYK, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and K for black. I didn't want to put a B on it. And black is actually the lack of color. Now this is reflected color, like you see in a photographic print or on a uh, painted canvas. 
And we're all familiar with the color wheel with uh, opposite colors. Uh, red is opposite cyan and magenta and green and so on and so forth. So we look for contrasting colors a lot of times because if, say if you're buying clothes, you don't wanna uh, have uh, colors that clash. Although sometimes maybe, maybe you want that. Um, so red and green Christmas colors, um, uh, blue and orange in this case, uh, red and blue in that case, uh, here's yellow and blue again. Where, color, where is color important? Well, here's two obvious pictures where color was very important. This cathedral, again in Guadalajara. I went to Guadalajara for a wedding. For, we were there for about a week, so I, I took a lot of pictures. And this, these are some uh, crab floats that was hanging on somebody's desk, deck in uh, Oceanside. Obvious uh, colors here, where the different colored boats. I saw this, this was in Newport, Oregon. And then this, this was a fish house and it had that yellow shovel, shovel hanging there. I thought, okay, that's a unique contrasting color. Autumn leaves, of course, are, colors are important. Uh, this one is called an accent color. This is back, still with that tequila distillery, and those are their modern stills. Very well automated. And so the accent color is the color that's different from everything else that draws your eye to it. Now we're gonna go into more composition. So the cameras, you don't, you're not like an artist, a painter, which who starts with a blank canvas. Your canvas is not blank. It's it's uh, got an image in your camera. As soon as you point it at something, there's an image. And so you're what you're going to do is manipulate that image you're gonna, by po either positioning what's in the image, uh, the objects, or positioning your camera. Now some people have some natural abilities for um, good composition uh, say that people say they have the eye other people don't and they just have to learn it by ex um, experience and sometimes uh, you have a composition it works you're not sure why or sometimes it doesn't work and you're still not quite sure why so every picture should at least have a subject. Why are you, why are you taking the picture if there's no subject? Um, and you should be concerned about how, how the viewer's eye is, photo, is flowing through the, uh, the image. We're going to talk about uh, elements of composition and then some of the rules of composition. So good tips for photos. Know your camera. That's the first thing. Know how to operate your camera and what it does. Read your manual. Scout out good locations. I am always looking for locations and looking to see where a possible picture is. Uh, go out and shoot. If you're not going to shoot, <laughs> there's no reason to take the scores. Um, try the same place more than once. And I go to that same place a lot of times. Uh, looking for different lighting situations, for example. Um, use a sturdy tripod. Use one that's uh, will hold your camera steady. Don't use one like you buy at Kmart or Walmart. Um, define your subject. Know what your subject's going to be. Analyze your light. And most of us only have one camera and a lens. So, the, although I have several cameras and numerous lenses, decide where you want to put your camera. That's, a, that's important, really. What am I trying to say? Why am I taking this photograph? Then you c compose within the frame. And I'll talk about the eliminate distractions, adjust all those things we talked about on your camera, take your photo. And then for those who want to really uh, get into photography, you need a, a, a good computer and editing software like Photoshop or On One or Lightroom, and there's a whole host of others. And I use most of them. So, what I'll look for in a 
photo, uh, some the right subject, dynamic co composition, the right light, of course, and I'd like to have some either a message or some move, a mood. So there's your camera frame. That's like the, fr the frame around a, pic a picture. That's, that's where, it, where you're going to compose your image and use the whole frame, not just part of it. So you find an engaging subject and then compose within the frame using, a, a, it needs to be in the right light and all these other things here. A good composition impacts the viewer. Um, again, compose in the entire frame, just, not just part of it. Um, there's a, an acronym called SCOOFY, which um, is close, shoot close up for impact. And it's just kind of a reminder to uh, move in and fill the frame. So these are some pictures of driftwood and rocks and the palm leaves and shadows and so on, but using the whole frame, not just part of it. And here's one where just, well, it's, it's an object, uh, objects and photographs. Okay, here's an object. It's not saying a whole lot, just a picture of a tree. Um, it could have been cropped a little more, so I used uh, not so much of the, uh, what we call negative space, which I'll get into in a moment. And here uh, we have multiple subjects, actually. Uh, we have the stills, the vats, and this guy stirring whatever he's stirring, the tequila. Okay, remember Art Wolf, the guy I talked about? Well, this is some, some of his course too, in composition. And one of, one, one of his slides said, you, an image should have emotional impact. And here's an example of one which he felt, and I feel, doesn't really have a, an impact. On, I don't feel anything emotional about this one. But however, this was taken in Iceland where you ha have the sun behind an iceberg uh, shining through this little piece, this piece of ice. And it has some interesting uh, shadows and interesting highlights and holds my interest a little more. Here's a a photo that I took this off the internet. It was actually out, off of video, <laughs> but I captured it because these these guys in the background didn't say much to me. But these two guys, I'm wondering what they're concentrating on, it makes me curious. What are they doing? Okay, avoid confusing subjects. I don't really have a subject in this photograph. I took this down in Newport just to show I didn't have a subject. But there are subjects in the camera. I mean, in the image here, um, for these, like these nets right here. Um, it could be a subject. Uh, reflections in the water, like that. That could be a subject. Way in the background, which I moved over there because I could see them that far away were these uh, fish boxes. They could be a subject. But to have them all in one photograph and all this other stuff around it, um, they're lost. Or on composition. These are uh, pile-up ropes that uh, were used for crab traps. I thought that I loved the composition in this. Okay, elements of design. We have shapes and some around different all kinds of geometric forms uh, these squares uh, could be uh, irregular spaces all kinds of spaces uh, and we're gonna put and shapes um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about positive space and negative space lines lines could be just a like a drawn line or it could be the edges of where two shapes meet. And lines have directions. What directions are, are they moving? Are they curved? Are they uh, uh, going across, horizontal, or what? Um, size relationships, big against small, and so on. Uh, textures, rough, smooth, whatever. Colors, of course, values, the lightness or duct, 
uh, darkness of the color. And then the principles of design, we're, talking, we're going to talk about balance, gradation, repetition, contrast, whether your picture is harmonious, does it satisfy you, uh, what's dominant in your picture, and uh, whether it's, everything is unified. Okay. Positive and negative space. The positive space is what your, your objects in the picture, what you're trying to take a picture of. And everything around it that doesn't say too much is negative space. And ideally, you kind of like to have your uh, positive space and negative space uh, in equal areas. Where are you going to place your objects? This is called the rule of thirds. And most, almost anybody who takes a, uh, any art courses uh, will learn the, the rule of thirds. Um, so your camera frame, frame can be, be divided up into nine segments here, uh, three across and three vertical. And you don't want to put your object right in the center of the picture, unless it's filling the whole frame. And what you look, what you try to do is put them at the intersections of these uh, these little squares. For example, on this picture where we have this bicyclist close to this intersection, and this uh, person sitting on the uh, curb close to that intersection, uh, not in the middle. A couple more examples. Um, this little, little girl walking down the road. Here's my example. Um, the boat was for closer to this, this uh, intersection or this intersection, and the, the logs balanced it out by being over on this side. So, as Art Wolf said, don't put your uh, subject in the middle. It just flattens the image, reduces the eye movement, uh, move it to the side somewhere so you have a lot more variety in your uh, photograph, doesn't it? Your eye moves through the whole photograph. It's not uh, zeroed in on this waterfall and ignoring everything else. Uh, breaking the rule of thirds. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's not a fast rule. Um, and leading lines, will do, you can do that. Um, this leading lines is going towards uh, lines leading towards the horizon. Um, they can converge uh, and indicate uh, depth and dif distance like this one does. And that one, oops, that one. And this one, where all these lines are pointing towards what's called the vanishing point. And if these mountains weren't here, this would be the horizon. Uh, we have a vanishing point on this one out off the off the frame, but you can see everything's all these uh, lines are leading towards the vanishing point. Same with this picture, um, leading lines. Vanishing point is off off the left of there someplace. Targeting. How many taken pictures are? or seeing pictures of people with their heads right in the middle of the fr frame. Uh, everything on top is meaningless and then their feet, feet or legs are cut off at the bottom. See that all, I see a, a lot of that. And I've done it myself. <laughs> Fill the frame, put your heads up uh, higher. Uh, here's a good example of one that the heads are all in the middle or lower bottom parts that are cut off and all this tree foliage up here is pretty mean, meaningless. Uh, distracting objects. Um, this is one of Art Wolf's again. Uh, and it, he decided this uh, log across the waterfall was a distracting object. So he, I'm not sure how he removed it, maybe Climbed up there and moved the log, or he took it out and post-processing. 
another distracting, oh, lots of wrong with this photograph. But <laughs> this is a uh, uh, phone, this light, light cord is plugged into her head. That's a distracting object. Don't place your horizon right in the middle of the photograph. What it does, it divides your photograph in two, two in half, essentially. So either raise the uh, horizon, either raise it up or lower it down. For example, here, I have the horizon up uh, fairly high. Down here, I have fairly low. Exception, if you have a really good reflection in water. For example, this is the uh, Tillamook River, the Taj Mahal, up in Alaska, these reflections in water. Then you can put your horizon in the middle. Balance. You, want, you don't want everything off to one side of your picture. You want some kind of balance. Um, this is a pretty heavy tree. But it is somewhat balanced by this, these trees over here on this side. The logs balance the boat. Uh, these three arch rocks are balanced by these uh, light uh, spots on the water. Positioning. Where are you going to push the, position your subjects? Uh, this one obviously got off to the side, cut off these buoys. That's some space in here that doesn't mean anything. It's your work though, where your subjects are positioned. Now, sometimes you can't get, <laughs> you can't get close enough to your subject to actually compose it well. So you are allowed to cut out <laughs> the portion that is composed well. So it's called cropping. And you do this generally on a computer. Um, there are, I think there are some cameras where you can and crop within the camera. Now, wide angle and telephoto lenses. Um, they go from, in this case, from 16 millimeters, which is a wide angle lens. And you see all these buildings in the background, you're taking in quite a wide angle. As you get up to a, a 200 millimeter lens, all that background is... Uh, magnified, yet she's still in the uh, the same size and in focus. And the way that was done is that the photographer keeps backing up from her as he uses a longer lens to keep her in the pos same position and changing the background. And it would do the same for the foreground too. Now, if you can't, this is a post-processing uh, uh, gimmick, but uh, or technique, I should say, technique, um, where if I can't get everything in the frame, I will take overlapping frames. And I think in this case, it was four frames going from, and this was in Bryce Canyon, this tree in a slot canyon, this is my sister-in-law. And I, in a computer, in Photoshop, you can merge these frames with the computer does is look for matching edges and will merge them into one complete frame. Uh, here's one of Tillamook, uh, I mean, Neatarts Bay. That was three photographs uh, merged together. And if, it, if, it, if they merge them properly, uh, you can't even see the seams. Other photo bombs. Don't put your finger in front of the lens with a, a single lens reflex or larger camera, you probably won't do that. But with a, the, a phone camera, it's really easy to do. I've done it too. That's my daughter and her husband. Keep your horizons horizontal. Even if the horizon is off just a little bit from horizontal, it's rather disturbing. And another thing right here is uh, Keep your shadow of a picture. This distracting objects again. Um, photo bombs. This was 
the original picture of that violinist. And this was in actually a, a train that went from Guadalajara to the uh, uh, Herradura distillery. And it was a great train ride. As soon as you got on the train, they started giving you tequila. And then we got out there and had a big celebration and tour and so on. And train ride back. Train ride going out, the mari mariachis were great. And the train, ride, train ride back, they were terrible. <laughs> okay, here's my beautiful daughter during her wedding and all these couple of photo bombs in the back. My daughter Serena. Okay, so what I did with the uh, mariachi is to get all those distractions in the back. More on composition. You can have simple uh, compositions or you can have complex ones. Here we have a very simple, almost abstract one with some limbs uh, being re reflected in the water. Um, this is Neetart's grocery that used to be. All kinds of things going on here. The old rusty get gas pump. And you, you can study this uh, for quite a while. Rusty uh, pickup truck, John Wayne standing in the uh, doorway. A couple ladies uh, sitting conversing uh, at this uh, table. All kinds of things. Shapes and flows, lines and angles make for interesting sub subjects. Shapes and flow, rhythms. If you're going to have uh, repeating elements, try and get some variety, at least in their sizes. Otherwise, if they're too repeating, then they get a little boring. Um, isolating sub subjects with uh, by adjusting your f, f stop. That's that's my mailbox in Oceanside. That thing's an, over 100 years old. Uh, shapes and flows and rhythms. Where is is your eye going to uh, follow these lines? Well, it'd be following this way, this way, that way. I took that in Arches National Park. Whole snag. Frame within a frame. That's kind of fun to do. There's a waterfall in the frame, framed by this limb, limb within this other frame, the whole camera frame. Uh, this is a called Lost Boy Cave. It's uh, just north of north of Oceanside. Big cave, big sea cave, and it's frame a frame within a frame. Contrast. Um, I talked about color contrast, and also there's black and white contrast. I didn't care a whole lot for the color contrast in this. Uh, I mean, there's different contrasting colors, but it just didn't do much for me. So I turned it into black and white. And I thought, at least for me, it, did, it was a better photograph, more intriguing. Fog can make it for interesting contrast, gives you a sense of depth. The accent element, we already talked about that. Um, you can break the monotony. Um, this was taken in, I took in Thailand, uh, a fisherman going out to set his traps and he had these beautiful uh, bright flags on his, uh, his buoys. It's, this is called a long tail boat. That's, a, that's their out, outboard motor. Perspective. Uh, I took this over in Oregon Gardens of the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house. And when you get down low, of course, your perspective is going to change a bit. And it's sometimes a little disturbing. And because these it looks like this wall is leaning. Well, in post-processing, you, you can correct for that. Uh, you put a grid on what you want to change and you start pulling these... Uh, points over until things are straight and do a little cropping and it looks a little bit no, more normal. Sense of scale. You wouldn't know how big this whole, this iceberg is, was, until you see this boat. That thing was huge. I didn't take it, I took this off the internet. Here's another sense of scale. I have a hunch that the uh, photographer uh, 
changed the scale on this. I took a picture of a waterfall. And, and then there's this guy standing here. That would be a, one huge waterfall. Or he may have pasted this person in here. But anyway, it does give you a sense of scale. Um, giant redwood. You wouldn't know how big it was unless this uh, woman uh, was standing next to it and giving you the sense of scale. It's huge. Cropping. We talked a little bit about cropping and I do a lot of cropping. Abstract. This doesn't have much to do with uh, photographing on the, on the bay or uh, landscape photography, but it's something you might want to try sometime. Uh, this, my son Christopher is also a good photographer. Um, in fact, has a degree in it from the University of Washington. And he was working at the, uh, the music, music experience, uh, what is it called? Um, anyway, it's this music museum in uh, Seattle that he worked at and had some very in interesting architecture in the building. So he was down, he was taking uh, pictures of the architecture. And by the way, this was taken on film. All these were. So some interesting abstract pictures. Macro photography. Um, if you're interested in macro, and, and it's a good way to uh, learn how to do some composition. Now, if you some cameras have the macro uh, feature built in, you just, you just turn to the right uh, dial and the macro feature, your camera will focus close up. Others, you have to have a macro lens or you can take a normal lens and put these little, uh, what they call extension tubes between the lens and the camera. What it does is move the lens away from the camera so less of the image is uh, projected onto the sensor. I use both of these. So this is, if you see the little tulip uh, in your consumer cameras, that means you can turn it to mac macro or even super macro. So uh, macro photograph, use a tripod for best results. That reduces camera movement. Polarize polarizers, um, you can get some pretty good effects with polarizing filters. Uh, light is polarized, in other words, light uh, travels in waves and the light waves vibrate in all directions. And what the polarizing filter does is it filters out the vibrations in certain uh, directions. So you put this polarizer, what's called circular pol polarizer on the front of your camera, the filter, and you'll get different effects. For one thing, it will filter out uh, specular highlights, say um, reflections off of the water or something like that, or reflections off of a window if you're trying to shoot uh, through a window. Um, because some of that light is actually polarized as it comes through the atmosphere. And so what you're doing is a cross-polarization. Polar, cross so here I got rid of these highlights and I got more green in there just by putting the uh, filter on. Um, a few differences in a landscape. Also, you can get a lot bluer skies if you're using a polarizing filter because the, as I said, the light coming through the atmosphere is already partly polarized. And so you turn the cross polarization on and uh, you get some very deep blue skies. I did this for emphasis of the, the white lighthouse. Try for a unique, get down low and take photographs, get up high and take photographs. People do aerial photographs. Uh, that was a photograph of, um, I don't know why I threw this in there, but I did. That's a, a reservoir, Rimrock Lake Reservoir up in Washington and it was drained and the sun was shining off the mud and I thought it was an interesting photograph. Uh, this is my son again when he was 
taking photograph <laughs> photography in high school actually and we had a couple of prisms at home and so he pho photographed his eyes in the prisms i thought that was pretty cool pretty clever another one he did was a multiple exposure and yes he still has long hair and he's a teacher in colorado and this <clears throat> took a picture of the sister and he wanted to get this uh light sun flare and he did that by putting a piece of window screen over the, the lens of his camera. So the light diffracted, diffracted around the, uh, the wires of the window screen. So you get, other, and you hunt for all kinds of different, uh, anywhere you go, you can, you can find a photograph, reflections off a car, uh, <clears throat> a bench with leaves on it. It's, and you do clever things like that. Funny photographs. I like a little humor. This is a case where you want to, where you position your camera just right. <clears throat> Same thing there. Again, it's positioning your camera. Clever. And this was my attempt with uh, a little humor. So that's the gist of the course. I have a couple more. Uh, before I did start doing uh, uh, photography, I did a different type of photography years ago uh, when I was working, National Laboratory. And that was using electrons instead of light. Uh, this is an electron. I just thought I'd throw these in. This is what we call an electron, um, a photo micrograph, not a photograph, but a photo micrograph. And these are some crystals, and I colored them in Photoshop. Some more crystals. So every so often, I uh, take pictures just for art's sake. The eye of a fruit fly. And some more crystals, just pretty shapes. Okay, that's it. How do we get back to Chrissy? <laughs> awesome, Jim. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> the fruit fly picture just uh, rocks my world. I just love it. Love that. How fruit uniform fly. and uh, it's really cool. Um, thanks, Jim. It's so informative. And um, we do have some questions that pop yes. into the chat function. So, and if you have a question, feel free to type it in, but I'm just going to kind of go through it. Um, they've been popping in and out throughout your presentation. So, Okay. Um, doo -doo. Um, so first one is what camera and lenses do you use or cameras, camera cameras and lenses? Okay. I have several cameras. My main ones are, I have both Can Canon and my Nikon. Uh, my Canon cam, my Nikon camera is what I call my field camera. This is the one I use for, uh, uh, field, I'm, I'm a biologist, by the way, and uh, I use it for mainly for documentation. This, and <clears throat> it's one where I don't have to do a lot of uh, manipulation of uh, f-stops and that sort of thing, and it will zoom from uh, goes up to 83x. It has a powerful zoom lens. It'll do close-ups. It'll do everything for me with just one lens. Now, my other camera that I use for, I have uh, several of them. I have a, on my microscope over here, I've got a uh, Canon uh, 5D Mark II. And my other camera is a 5D Mark IV Canon. And it's a pretty good professional camera. I have a lot of lenses everything from macro to wide angle to telephoto, um, got a whole range of them. Uh, that's why I made this a business. So I sell photographs so I can afford this hobby. <laughs> a, a fun thing that pays for itself, right? <laughs> um, good, that's great, that's great information. Um, 
uh, or just put this idea in your head if you had an idea for a good starter camera. You don't need to share it now, but maybe we can think about that and share it later. Um, another person wrote, how do you know when the golden hour is? Um, it depends on the photographer. <laughs> Usually when the, the, the sun is low on the horizon, uh, before sunset, and some photographers likely go after sunset. Um, I like to use it just, just before sunset or during sunset. But actually, uh, since we're uh, fairly high up in the north here, we're above the 45th parallel anyway, even in the winter time, uh, the sun is lower in the, fairly low in the horizon uh, even during midday, not like summer where it's right overhead. Uh, so that can also be kind of a golden hour, but it's usually just before sunset or, or after sunrise. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, can you give an example of when you would versus when you wouldn't use a flash? I, okay, um, if I'm in a, you know, a dimly lit room with a lot of people, yeah, I use a flash. Um, if I take so you had a dinner party, so you're standing up at the end of the uh, dinner table taking the pictures and, and the light's low, use a flash. Um, also, I, I talked about the fill-in flash. Um, it eliminates the, uh, um, shadows. So even in midday, um, if the sun is not shining, if you, if your subject has a deep shadow in it, you can fill that in with a flash. Okay. Yeah. This is a fun one. I actually am curious about this myself. Who is your favorite photographer and why? Oh, my favorite is Ansel Adams. <laughs> yeah. Now, Ansel Adams did not do much uh, color photography. Most of his are black and white, but they're superb. Mm -hmm. uh, the balance, the contrast, the subjects, the way your eye moves through his photographs, and what, how he emphasizes things, uh, it's just amazing. Yeah. So, he's can't, my favorite. I can't, Unfortunately, can't he's no longer with us, but, you know. <laughs> this photograph still are. Yes, that's for sure. We have a couple in our house. Um, do you have a software program um, for editing that you find your, <clears throat> sorry, you find yourself using most and which one is it? Uh, Photoshop. Photoshop. Okay. Now that, saying that, uh, that's made by Adobe. Adobe also makes a photo editor called Lightroom, which is really good. I use that sometimes, but within Photoshop, there is um, one called Camera Raw. Now, I haven't talked about taking pictures in raw mode or compressed mode. Uh, the more advanced cameras will take pictures, what's called raw mode, in that the camera doesn't do much processing. You have to do it yourself. Uh, the, the consumer ca cameras do a lot of processing for you. So what you get out of the ca cameras, uh, then processed and reduced in size, like a JPEG. And actually, when I take a picture, I take them in both modes, JPEG and camera raw. Same, same picture, it records mm -hmm. it in both, both uh, formats. So, <clears throat> so also there are a lot of add-ons to Photoshop, what they call them. Um, there's another, uh, photo editing program that's really good, uh, made, made in Portland actually, uh, called On One Photography. Uh, On One. Um, that's the company. Go back and look. Um, and I use it as I can get to it, but by um, through photo, through Photoshop, or I can use it as a standalone. Uh, there, there's another little 
add-on called Nick Photography. It's uh, used to be free, but now they pay. Now you got to pay for it. Um, there's uh, something new I've been doing called luminosity masking. I'm not going to get into that at all, but um, it's a way of adjusting your the lights and shadows and colors in your photograph. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of information. So it seems like Adobe is kind of your basic. It is. Your base mm -hmm. editor. Yeah. And Photoshop is probably the most powerful editing program out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, they seem to have the some things cornered in that market. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions right now, but if there's something that pops into your brain, um, please do share. I am going to.